Good evening, everyone, and thank you for joining for our event tonight with Dr. Brooke Messer. She's going to be presenting on keratoconus, which lens design works best. I'll be your host tonight. My name is Dr. Arielle Serenzi. So I'm super excited to present our speaker. I'm sure she looks familiar to, to you all. Uh, Dr. Messer received her Doctor of Optometry degree from Southern California College of Optometry and subsequently went on to specialize in cornea and specialty contact lenses by completing a one-year residency. She is highly trained in fitting specialty contact lenses for keratoconus, post-surgical corneas, and other corneal diseases, as well as multifocal and orthokeratology lenses. She has authored many articles for various publications and enjoys teaching other doctors complex contact lens fitting techniques and surgical co-management topics in classroom and clinical settings. Dr. Messer is a fellow of the American Academy of Optometry and Scleral Lens Education Society. She serves on the Education Committee for the North Dakota Optometric Association and is the advisor to the Optometric Residency Program at Vance Thompson Vision in West Fargo, North Dakota. Outside the office, Dr. Messer chases around her two kids with her husband, Brian. She loves to golf, hike, and visit family back in her hometown of Dickinson, North Dakota. So we are so excited to hear from her, and um, she is gracing us with her presence after a long day in clinic seeing all of these types of patients. So um, these are her financial disclosures, all of which have been mitigated, and I will have you take it away from here, Dr. Messer. Thank you for the introduction. Um, it was a great day in clinic, had plenty of contact lenses, of course, and had a little kitty Halloween party at the end of it all. And so it was um, fun to get the kids from the office around. Um, and so without further delay, we'll go ahead and get going on our chat here. Um, so uh, as introduced, I'm Dr. Brooke Messer, and today we're just gonna talk about a summary of contact lenses for keratoconus. Um, our course goals are really to understand how we can utilize the tools that we have in clinic um, to help us influence or to help us decide what lenses to pick. Um, so we're going to talk about contact lens designs and how we can select them based on cornea shape and the severity of the condition. And we're also going to understand how each you know, lens design affects corneal health and talk about techniques of each design. Um, if you hear me talk about contact lenses and keratoconus before, I cannot, I certainly cannot get away from first what we have to do prior to the fitting of contact lenses in our patients of keratoconus. Um, in 2015, there was a, a Delphi panel to talk about new consensus amongst uh, patients that have keratoconus and how we look at these patients, how we classify them and um, how we decide who has keratoconus and who doesn't. Um, we used to say that patients with keratoconus had thin corneas. And now we say that they have an abnormal thickness distribution. So they don't have to be thin anymore to have keratoconus. Posterior corneal ectasia is essential to the diagnosis of keratoconus. So again, if you're waiting to see it on the anterior cornea, but you're otherwise suspicious, you're probably too late to the diagnosis. So once you start having some patient complaining about vision quality, or you're seeing some sort of weird reflex on that retinoscopy, make sure you get that patient in for a screening. And uh, the Delphi panel continues to, uh, to uh, conclude that keratoconus is a non-inflammatory condition, which is continued acceptance from previous descriptions like the CLEC studies. Um, however, the newest data, even since 2015, has said maybe there's a little inflammatory component, you know, kind of a subclinical inflammation in keratoconus. So maybe the jury is out on that one. Um, in order to diagnose keratoconus early and to properly manage these patients, we need to diagnose the disease early, and that's done by tomography, as I mentioned before. So if you're suspicious um, about a patient in your chair that might have keratoconus, make sure that you get a, um, a pentacam or an instrument that can do corneal tomography on them to really highlight and view that posterior cornea to see if we can see some of that early ectasia so that they can be managed with corneal cross-linking. And this should all be done to contact lenses. As much as I, when I see a new keratoconus patient, um, you know, the first thing I want to do is improve their vision because that's usually why they're there. But I know deep down the goal is to, uh, you know, stabilize their cornea and then fit them in contact lenses. And then lastly, um, global pachymetry, because we we need, we know that patients with keratoconus have an abnormal thickness distribution. Um, so manual pachymetry is really no longer sufficient. Um, we need that global pachymetry 
OCTs can do it. Um, you know, Pentacam certainly are the gold standard to get that tomography topography scan. Um, so again, these are the tools we're going to use to diagnose keratoconus early. And then now we can correct vision. So we need to detect and diagnose, stabilize, and now we can correct vision and move into our use of contact lenses. And when I think about keratoconus, I can't really think of anything that goes with it better than contact lenses. Um, so we'll get rocking and rolling here when we talk about keratoconus. Um, but first, I want to highlight maybe the real PB&J, which is um, a bunch of contact lens nerds, Ed Bennett and Elvis Presley. So this is at the GPLI contact lens reunion, contact lens residence reunion this past summer. And um, these are a bunch of great people here. This was my residency class back in 2010. So um, when I think of keratoconus, I also think of all of these people um, and where our careers are at today and, you know, uh, impacting and managing these patients. So when we talk about contact lens fitting and safe contact lens fitting in our patients with keratoconus, um, we think about them a little bit differently than we would think about patients wearing, you know, traditional soft contact lenses that we can throw away every day or every month. The epithelium at the corneal apex in a patient with keratoconus is going to be the thinnest compared to the rest of the cornea. So you can see this epithelial map here on this cornea. And while our normal epithelium is roughly 50 microns across the whole way, you can see the thinning there at the apex and that the epithelium actually tries to mask the cone. And that's why the epithelium gets thin at the top and thicker at the base. So it actually tries to mask that cone and regularize the vision the best it can. And because of that thinning at the apex, that's where the epithelium is most delicate. And so when we're fitting these lenses, we really need to be aware of where that cone is, where the apex of the cone is, so that we don't have any, um, you know, abrading of the apex while these patients are wearing their lenses. Um, then we want to think about the mid-peripheral cornea. Um, there are corneal GP lenses, hybrid lenses, scleral lenses. And if we're not properly assessing that mid-peripheral cornea, we could be creating some seal off with different types of lenses. And that's where we can create some potential for neovascularization and, and other inflammatory responses. And sometimes we can even kind of trap a tear layer underneath these lenses, which we'll see some images later. And you kind of get that toxic buildup, toxic staining um, underneath these lenses. And so we want to take a look at uh, all of these points. And finally, it's the limbus. Um, you know, really the limbus, you know, holds those stem cells for proper corneal healing um, and uh, uh, proper surface. Um, so we obviously have to be very delicate around the limbus as well. And then we move out and think about the conjunctival and scleral surface. And when we think about lenses that land out onto the sclera and the conj, we need to think about lenses that aren't too tight or too loose. A, a lens that's too tight can dig into the conj and you can actually create kind of like a little gutter um, in the conjunctiva and the, the conjunctiva can actually uh, kind of roll right over, uh, over to the lens, kind of create some atrophy or almost like a callus or nodule in the conj. We can certainly irritate pinguahila or other surface irregularities. Um, and a lens that's actually lifting too much can irritate the eyelids you know, by uh, stimulating allergies, ocular surface disease, and um, lid papillae. When it comes to design selection, we really need to remember that ocular health trumps all. So it, it you know, it, unfortunately, it can't be patient comfort, it can't be patient preference, it can't be practitioner preference. It really needs to be what's going to maintain that corneal health, which is usually driven by the severity of the uh, condition or keratoconus in this case. Um, and corneal shape. And so when we look at our toolbox of contact lenses uh, for patients with keratoconus, you know, there's soft lenses that we can just grab right out of our fitting sets. Just because they have keratoconus doesn't mean that they're not candidates for those lenses. And we'll go over what patients make them a candidate for that. If they need just a little bit more in their soft lenses, we can go a custom soft lens. You know, maybe we throw a gas perm lens at them. And, you know, like my little hunter here, um, throwing that golf club around, the goal of this lecture is so that you can step up to a patient with keratoconus confidently and not just feel like you're swinging, you know, a golf club and swinging and missing. Um, hopefully at the end of this lecture, you have a more confident approach um, and feel good about what, what lens you're putting on your patient. So let's talk about some of the simpler lenses first, because I've definitely been there where I see a patient with keratoconus. I think they need maybe a scleral contact lens or a hybrid. We go through this fitting and they're still not happy at the end of it. And um, I go maybe and re-refract re their glasses and find out that 
holy cow, this patient actually sees pretty well through glasses. Let me just go try a soft toric lens. And then we put the lens on and they see actually pretty well. So do, you know, remember that if you have a patient who has keratoconus, but maybe that apex is well below the visual axis and you look at their, oops, you look at their, um, line of sight there, and it's actually pretty regular. There's not a whole lot of irregular astigmatism or um, even astigmatism period in this patient's line of sight. Um, go for it. Try a disposable soft lens on and see what kind of vision you can get for these patients. Again, a good indicator is if they can see pretty well through their glasses, they're probably going to do just fine in a disposable lens. These patients still have aberrations and some other you know, imperfections in the way that they see. And so do consider one extra over refraction once you put these lenses on eye. So don't just you know, take what their refraction is and put it on and then you know, call that good. Do consider one extra really good over refraction to fine tune that vision just in case you know, something in their aberration profile changes with that new lens on and you can make one further adjustment to um, really fine tune that vision. We know the pros of soft lenses, disposable soft lenses. We can grab them immediately out of our fitting sets. They have lots of oxygen. Um, they're easily replaced if ripped or lost. They're com comfortable. However, there's specialty contact lenses for a reason. You know, these disposable lenses, we can't adjust the fit if needed. Really, we just have the ability to adjust the power. And we don't, we can't always access all the powers that we would like for our patient. Um, and these lenses don't really negate irregular astigmatism all that well. And that's why we need to see those nice clean Ks in the visual axis. So kind of moving up the ladder in complexity, if you have a patient that has um, a little bit more irregularity, maybe a slightly larger size cone or slightly approaching the visual axis, but still relatively clean um, centrally, you could definitely try a custom soft lens for patients with irregular corneas. Um, these patients typically have decent acuity through their glasses, but maybe a little bit more irregular astigmatism associated with it. So they can see 2025 or 2020, but it's not very clean. That's when I start thinking, hey, this patient's probably a decent candidate for a custom soft lens. Um, my tips on these is, um, first off, there's fitting sets available or uh, some labs will take K's RX, an image of their topography and help you design these lenses. So you can go bo go with both fitting set um, or empirical lens design. And when you get the lens on eye, I like to make sure that, that my fit is really good. So I'll adjust the lens diameter or the lens base curve to make sure that it's moving just enough how I like it. Um, it's not rotating if I have astigmatism correction in the lens. And um, then I'll really hone in after on the fine tune power adjustments. So if you're really chasing, you know, some over refractive astigmatism and you're still changing the fit, um, sometimes it's hard and you can end up chasing your tail a little bit. So really hone in on a really nice lens fit first and then go in and fine tune those um, small amounts of astigmatism or, um, you know, whatever it may be from a visual need for these patients. Um, the lens thickness is really what helps with aberration correction in these custom soft lenses. Um, so some of the lenses will actually have like a thickness factor or a irregular astigmatism negating factor, and it usually has to do with the thickness of the lens. And when other practitioners hear like, ooh, a thick soft lens, aren't you concerned about oxygen? And these lenses actually move just a little bit more than a typical soft lens. So they get more tear exchange. And to be honest, um, you know, many patients who wear these custom soft lenses, their corneas look so good year over year um, that, you know, over time, as I see more and more patients, you know, 13 years in now, um, I worry less and less about oxygen in these patients uh, wearing these custom lenses. You know, we're so spoiled in disposable lenses with DK well over 100. And, you know, these seem, you know, hardly sufficient in the, you know, mid 20s or so. Um, but again, patients really do well. And so if you do have to increase that thickness to create some uh, or to negate some more irregular astigmatism, uh, I wouldn't worry about that from a corneal health perspective, because again, these lenses move just enough. They kind of have this little pumping mechanism that creates that tear flow under the lens. Um, and patients can really do quite well long term in these lenses. So again, when we think about these custom soft lenses, we're going to have a base curve diameter. 
You can specify material, which a lot of the times determines oxygen and lens wettability. So if you're not sure, you can definitely talk to the lab consultant on how to decide what lens material you would use in these custom soft lenses. And again, that's what these consultants are there for. They answer these questions all day long. So certainly don't be shy when it comes to deciding on, you know, hey, I'm not sure even what this material is like. Let them walk you through those options so that you can make sure to make a good choice for your patient. Um, again, we can specify thickness on these lenses, um, any sphere, astigmatism, or axis. So 360 degree, or 180 degrees, I guess, um, for these prescriptions. And then another nice part about these custom soft lenses is that you can actually uh, control the amount of prism ballasting or whatever the stabilization optics they have. Um, many times you can increase it or decrease it depending on what the patient needs. Decrease lens awareness, increase stability. You can make those changes. Um, to improve the patient wearing experience. Um, so these lenses, because they are just a touch thicker, sometimes they have a little bit more to the edge of the lens, um, they'll need a little bit more time to settle on the eye. Uh, the patient may be like blinking a little bit more aggressively or forcefully at first. So do give yourself some time um, to let that lens really settle in. Um, and that will also improve patient comfort. Uh, this video over here is a patient who has keratoconus, but they are, um, oops, trying to play that video again for you. Um, you know, their apex is uh, relatively deep and they're wearing a soft lens. And um, so this lens just isn't getting that proper drape. So we would definitely be one of shifting. We would want to shift out of a uh, disposable soft torque into a custom lens on this patient. Some tips to know when you're working with these lenses is they will have markers on them to help you determine the location of rot rotation, just like a disposable soft lens. They're going to look different, and every lab has different markers on the surface of their lens. Um, so it's helpful to know ahead of time what markers you're looking for and where they're supposed to be, um, just to um, ease up that uh, observation at first. Um, again, they're going to have slightly more movement than a disposable lens, and Patients with keratoconus in these soft lenses, I find they they tend to take a little more minus than they actually need. So I over-refract both eyes as I typically would. And then I do a really good binocular balance. And I actually find that they kick out a bit of minus um, after uh, you do their individual, um, each individual eye when they're over-refraction. And then of course, um, retinoscopy, even if you're not totally comfortable doing retinoscopy on irregular corneas, um, if you do retinoscopy before you put the lens on and then retinoscopy after the lens has settled, that will give you an idea of what kind of vision um, quality improvements um, that you'll be that this patient is um, observing through their through their custom soft lenses. Next, let's go ahead and move into some of the gas permeable lens designs, which is I'm a GP girl at heart. so i I absolutely love working with gas perms. And uh, corneal GP lenses, the Nowadays, when we talk about uh, fitting lenses on keratoconus, it goes all scleral, scleral, scleral. But hopefully tonight you learn a little bit about the value of corneal gas perms on these patients with keratoconus. I just, I think that, you know, when I look at patients who've been wearing GP lenses, well-fit corneal GP lenses for a really long time, they look excellent. Their corneas look so healthy. Um, their limbus looks amazing. And again, these are definitely still a strong tool in the toolbox. Um, I'll definitely admit that I fit more sclerals than I have 10 years ago on initial fits. Um, but these are st still a really strong tool in the toolbox. Um, and we'll go over why in just a second here. So patients who have uh, mild to moderate irregularity that can affect their visual axis, um, this is where we want to start thinking about a corneal GP lens. And an important thing, because these lenses are smaller, you know, they're going to fit within the limbus, we, the, we want to see the apex of their corneas toward the center um, of the cornea because the lens will go over and it will center over the apex of the lens. So if you have a really low apex, you're not going to get that lens to center because, again, the, the the, de the deepest part of the lens wants to go over the apex of the cornea. So in order to have a really nice fit with corneal gas perms, we want to see a central location of the apex on the cornea. And then, of course, uh, we start thinking about gas permeable optics when patients don't have the acuity that we would hope they have um, through soft lenses. So once they start struggling in glasses and soft lenses, then we're going to start thinking about um, doing gas permeable optics. 
the design of corneal GP lenses, uh, first off, it's going to be the base curve. That's, you know, the middle of the lens. That's where the optics are or the optical zone diameter. That's going to be the base curve. And then we have a mid peripheral curve system. That's usually one to two curves that help transition the lens out to the flatter peripheral curves. Of course, we're going to specify the lens power and lens material. There are many gas permeable lens materials, and um, we can be selective on some uh, for different reasons. Sometimes it's oxygen. Sometimes it's the patient wants a color. I have more than one patient that comes in requesting the most vivid green or the most vivid blue that you can give them because they literally cannot see with the lens off. So they, they want the darkest pig tinted lens that you can get for them. Um, so those regular handling tints maybe just aren't good enough. And sometimes you have to flip over into different types of materials that can allow for that more dense pigment to allow them to see the lens when the lens is off their eye. Um, thankfully, most of the time, patients with keratoconus, um, they're what I would call their regular astigmatism that maybe they would have if they didn't have keratoconus is taken care of by the GP optics, as well as the irregular astigmatism. So most of these lenses are not going to need over-refractive astigmatism in the lens. Um, the When we think about doing fitting of these lenses, um, the way that I've always used it, and this is when going back to even my residency year, uh, when I'm looking at a patient's corneal topography, I'll look at where their apex is located. Um, if it's fairly centered, then I will use roughly the Ks to uh, select the first diagnostic lens out of the fitting set. Um, if the apex is slightly below the line of sight, but I'm still considering doing a gas perm, then I'll usually go between that average K and the max K. And the reason is on a topography, when it spits out an average keratometry reading, um, that average K is actually what's over the patient's visual axis, the central three millimeters of the scan. So it doesn't actually include the max K in that average K if the max K is outside the central three millimeters. Um, so I usually go between average K and max K for my first diagnostic lens. Um, if I'm using, um, or excuse me, if the apex of the cornea is below the visual axis. And what you're going to be watching for is we're going to put the lens on and we're obviously going to evaluate the apex and we're going to align, we're going to check for the alignment at the apex of the lens. And then I'm going to look at the edge of that base curve or the edge of the optical zone and see how that allows for tear exchange underneath the lens as it moves with the patient's blink. What we'll see is this lens can actually bind down, and that usually happens when the optical zone is much larger than the shape of the, of the cone of the cornea. So if we have kind of a small nipple cone and the optical zone diameter is significantly larger, um, it just, because there's such a gap um, between the cone and the edge of the optical zone, that's when we start to get that lens binding. Um, and thankfully, these lenses are pretty darn customizable. Um, you can even design your own GP lens uh, with some labs uh, with your own optical zone diameter. But again, many of the labs have the ability to change the optical zone to kind of customize around that cone. So if you have a smaller cone, you can create a smaller OZD so that you get that better alignment. And then your mid peripheral curves can extend a bit to, again, transition out to those flatter peripheral curves. Um, so really looking at the size of your optical zone diameter compared to the size of the cone, it, in my uh, experience, has been a really um, a big learning and a big take-home pearl that has helped me be successful in fitting these gas perms, um, even over fairly steep corneas, as long as that apex is centered. So we're going to, again, we're going to look at the alignment over the apex. We want to see some tear film kind of uh, washing over the apex with blink. And then we look at those mid peripheral curves um, and the peripheral curves of the lens um, on this lens, per, mid, the mid, excuse me, the peripheral curves are quite small, sometimes a half millimeter in um, uh, in width. And so, again, that's not going to change a lot in fit. So when if you have a lens that really needs to change the fit, um, that needs to be done in the base curve and the mid peripheral curves. These peripheral curves are really for fine tuning that lid awareness um, and you know, decreasing the risk of Delin or 3.9 staining um, adjacent to the lenses. So don't bank on those peripheral curves to make a big change to your fit. Um, those are, again, those are really just fine tuning the fit, fine tuning the fit and the patient experience. 
Um, as I mentioned before, really, we only need a spherical power um, when we are working with these lenses. Um, and just remember when it comes to doing a retinoscopy starting point or over refraction starting point is that as these base curves get steeper, the lenses are naturally going to be more minus in power, you know, steeper add minus. And so if you have a lens that's, you know, 55 diopters um, um, in the base curve, you probably need to crank in a bit of minus to get a good starting point for that over refraction. Um, there are, as I mentioned before, many, many material options for wettability, tint, and oxygen needs. Um, and so really all you have to do is talk to your laboratory consultant and say, hey, this is what the patient's like. They'll ask you some questions to help you decide. Um, and you can come up with uh, many, many good options for these patients. We have excellent materials available um, for these patients. When we look at the apex, again, we're going to look for the bearing, a clearance, or alignment. And really what you want to see, again, is tear film flushing over the apex of the cornea. You know, when we look at this top picture here, this looks like this is a relatively low cone, and it looks like it's bearing quite a bit. But it could be a good fit if, as this patient blinks and moves, we see tear film, you know, flushing over the surface. Um, if I'm not sure, you can let the patient wear them for a week and then check back and then look at the apex. Are you having a little bit of staining or not? Um, and that will tell you what that apical relationship is like. Um, you know, looking at it, looking at this picture, it's probably a little bit flat, but when we sometimes a still picture doesn't show us enough. You know, we really need to see how that lens moves. Um, there's probably a bit of edge lift on this one that could be fine-tuned to um, decrease some lens awareness. But again, the, the big thing to know is that it's okay for contact lenses to touch the apex. We don't have to clear the apex with these lenses. We just need to see good tear film flushing over the apex um, as the patient blinks. Moving into the mid-peripheral zone, um, again, if we have a, an optical zone that's too large, that's when we can create some dimple veiling around the cone of the eye. And so this is a picture here that where the fluorescein is just collecting in those little dimples. Um, so what happens is if the um, optical zone is too large over the cone, some little bubbles can pump in and they get trapped in that optical zone and then they create those dimples. So if you see um, dimple veiling underneath the uh, center of a corneal GP, whether it's a patient with keratoconus or, you know, a normal cornea, um, you can consider either flattening the base curve if it's applicable or decreasing the optical zone size, and that should mitigate your, um, your dimple veiling. Um, this patient here had a lens that was riding too high, um, so kind of the junction between the optical zone and the mid-peripheral curves were hitting the apex of his cornea uh, inferior to the pupil there. And then since the deepest part of the lens was riding high, that's why we were getting those bubbles creating that dimple veiling. So again, those mid-peripheral curves can really tell us a lot about how the lens is positioning um, and uh, adjusting them by flattening or you know decreasing the sag of the lens by loosening it up. Um, that can mitigate a lot of problems. When we talk about lens binding, dimple veiling, you know, all of those things have to do with the size of the optical zone and the mid-peripheral curve system. And I think it's a good time to pause and talk about the epithelium of patients with keratoconus. Um, it grows differently compared to patients who do not have keratoconus. And those of us who don't have keratoconus, our epithelium kind of grows in these nice sheets where patients um, who have keratoconus, their epithelium actually grows in a swirl-like pattern. So if you see a little bit of swirling, um, you know, just a little bit of um, observation of their epithelium, the swirling itself is normal. So that's not an infection or, or anything like that. Um, but what is abnormal is if you can actually see the optical zone like you can here and then a, a mid-peripheral zone junction. So what's happening here is this patient, one, may be sleeping in their lens because it really looks like that lens is not moving. Um, their keratoconus could have progressed since the last time we saw them. So now really that cone is, you know, mashing up the backside, mashing up against the backside of that corneal GP. Um so in general, we probably need to um, keep this patient out of their lenses for a while, let that apex heal up, and then reassess. Um, this is a patient actually from my residency, and we hadn't seen him in a few years. And um, I needed to change his base curve by seven diopters in order to relieve that apical staining. So um, again, if you can see those junctions, the lens is not moving, you're not getting good tear exchange in there. So we need an adjustment in the base curve and the mid peripheral curves to allow for better tear exchange. 
Um, when we look at the position, again, we want to interpalpebral, um, and we want to try to avoid a high or a low lens because that's where we're going to run into trouble with some lens binding. Um, the edge lift can be steepen or flattened as indicated, and it's usually for um, comfort. Um, so when we look at lens movement, um, too much movement, the patient, like on this image here, um, the patient is going to have a lot of visual disruption and um, probably a lid inter or excuse me, a lid reaction to all that lens movement. So we would like to see limited movement, a little bit of, you know, again, just enough to provide some tear exchange um, and to prevent binding. Um, so again, we want that slight tear pump on every blink and um, seeing that, that fluorescein wash over the apex. Um, lid attachment, you know, on a patient without keratoconus, lid attachment is okay because it really moves nicely and it kind of glides across that corneal surface. But we don't want too much movement with lid attach because that can sort of abrade the apex. So I try to avoid um, lid attachment with my patients unless they have very mild keratoconus. Um, and just a reminder on the over-refraction, a lot of these patients may have higher over-refractions, so just don't forget to vertex when you're ordering that first lens. Moving on to hybrid contact lenses, um, we're going to talk about first uh, the lens design. Um, so hybrid lenses are are just as uh, just as they seem. They're a combination of two types. So we have the center GP. So we get all the um, the benefits of a gas permeable lens, and the GP portion is designated by a base curve. And then we have a skirt with um, and in the hybrid contact lens realm, there's various fit curvatures depending on the design. Um, they can be steep, flat, or customized curvatures in the skirt. Um, and the optics are spherical gas perms because, again, they're kind of aimed at similar to those corneal GPs that we just talked about. So many of the time, many times you actually don't need that over refractive astigmatism. Patient candidates, again, are going to be those mild to moderate um, KC patients. Um, they can also do post surgical eyes, but today we're going to talk mostly about how it how they are uh, uh, applicable to patients with keratoconus. can certainly use them on regular corneas as well. Um, and patients who have keratoconus that have maybe struggled with um, gas perms because of comfort or maybe lens ejection, um, they can be really good candidates for these lenses. Um, and soft toric wares or custom soft lens wares that struggle with, you know, their stability of their lenses. So they have vision fluctuation um, uh, or, you know, stability and comfort. When we're looking at a hybrid contact lens, it's similar to the corneal uh, corneal GPs, um, except thankfully that skirt gives us just a little bit more uh, flexibility and forgiveness when it comes to the lens centering. Um, ideally, a patient with a hybrid lens should have a centered apex, because um, again, that GP is going to want to go where the cone is. Um, and they do have various designs for increasing severity. So there are certain aspects of hybrid or certain designs in the hybrid lens realm that can accommodate for a more severe cone, which gives you a little bit more flexibility if the cone is a little inferior um, compared to center. But in general, your, your most successful fits are going to be, and your most straightforward fits are going to be those patients with a, a nice and centered apex. Um, again, when you're doing your over-refraction, um, whether it's a GP or from a hybrid fitting kit, um, we want to see minimal over refraction, um, minimal over refractive astigmatism, excuse me, because these lenses are made in spherical powers only. Um, and sometimes these lenses can be a little difficult to remove. Um, so I like to make sure that my patients have decent dexterity so that they're not uh, stuck at home, you know, at 10 p.m. at night trying to remove their lenses. Um, and so, again, if you have a nice centered apex um, and these patients are able to handle their lens as well, you're going to do pretty well with these patients. When it comes to fitting a hybrid contact lens, there are a couple ways you can go about it. Um, you can still use a fitting set and some of their more advanced designs for more complicated corneas do have those fit sets and it's helpful to be able to take that out, put a lens on and compare it to other shapes within the fitting set. Um, but a lot of the times you can go empirical too. So um, what I usually do is if I have a fitting set that I like, I'll, or if I have the fitting set that I'm planning to um, use for this particular patient, I'll put a few lenses on, I'll do some over refractions, and then I'll call the lab and I will send them the patient's um, corneal topography and have them look at all of the data. I'll give them, hey, this is what I did for my over refraction. This is what I saw on the fit and the lens movement and centration. 
Um, what do you think? And then they run their numbers and get their empirical design. And we kind of look at um, what what their findings come up with. And then we make a decision on you know what ultimately to put the patient in. Um, so having both sets of data is certainly nice to kind of expedite um, the fitting process and get you to a nice, a nice spot um, quicker than maybe choosing just one option in the fitting process. Once the lens is on eye, um, you're going to start inside out. So you'll look at the um, position and alignment to the cornea. Um, you'll look at, you kind of look at the GP portion in itself. And I like to see it similar to a corneal gas perm. So I'll, I'll see kind of an alignment to the apex, maybe a little bit of fluorescein exchange between the skirt and the edge of the GP. I want to see a little bit of movement in the skirt when the patient blinks. Um, and again, a nice over refraction with um, ease of lens removal. Um, looking at these images here, I always think about how you know, a lot of the times you take pictures of uh, bad fits. You know, you take pictures of problems because that's what you're sending to your lab consultants um, or colleagues to get advice. So I didn't have a great picture of a nice hybrid fit. Um, when I'm looking at the picture on the upper right here, this lens is too deep. You know, the, the uh, base curve is, you know, far too um, deep over this uh, patient's cornea. So I'm probably at risk for getting some seal off and some binding. And you can just see that they're right at the edge of that GP portion. Um, so this patient may end up with kind of a toxic tear layer or some eye discomfort after several hours because um, that lens can really bind down there. So this probably needs, you know, some change to the base curve and maybe even the skirt power so that we can get some uh, decent tear exchange underneath that lens design. Don't see lens fluting uh, or edge fluting all that much um, in these lenses if you have a proper base curve or uh, proper GP portion um, on the on the patient. However, if you do put a hybrid on and the patient has significant depth to their carriage conus, you will get some edge fluting because it's just the lens is just not deep enough for the patient's cornea. So then you'll want to make sure to go up at least a step or two. Um, in the fitting set so that you can get a lens that actually properly uh, vaults over that cornea. All lenses come with a wettability coating, which is really nice. It attracts uh, liquid to the surface of the lens, which helps prevent deposits. It helps with vision uh, fluctuations and it keeps their, their vision nice and stable. Um, and so those are really nice. Um, and six month is the recommended replacement. Um, so with in combination with that wettability coating, it's really nice because by the time the wettability coating maybe breaks down a little bit, maybe they start getting some deposits and then it's time for a new lens. So patients who do have deposits, the, that one, two punch of the uh, what's called tangible hydropeg um, in combination with the more frequent replacement compared to corneal gas perms or a scleral lens. Um, it's a, a really nice combination for patients that have issues with depositing on their lenses. And I can't stress it enough, um, use those consultants to help you decide what, what design to use. They're continuing to expand their options in hybrid lenses. Um, and so it's good to, to call in every once in a while and understand, you know, where your patient may fit in their, um, in their product line. And, you know, we really can't get away from talking about scleral lenses and keratoconus, you know, it's just such a huge part of managing keratoconus and a huge part of the specialty contact lens industry. And they're such awesome tools um, and, you know, game changers for these patients that previously were unable, like this patient on my bottom picture. Uh, this is another patient that I fit during my residency year that his cornea was just so darn steep, he couldn't even really wear a corneal lens anymore because it would just, you know, move too much and fall out when he was looking around trying to drive. Um, and now we have a lens that doesn't even touch his cornea and he's seeing, you know, better than ever. Um, scleral lenses really have a wide candidacy range. Um, and it, many patients can wear a scleral lens as well. Um, it's often the best candidate for those with really irregular corneas because we take the cornea out of the picture. You know, we're not vault, we, we are vaulting over the irregularity completely. We can put front toric astigmatism on um, for patients that need it. Um, and these lenses are even applicable for patients who have severe ocular surface disease where we're dealing with weak epithelium or a delicate ocular surface. So just a really wide candidacy range. Um, sometimes, you know, I, I pause when I think about prescribing scleral lenses. And the reasons I do that are if I know a patient maybe has some dexterity issues um, or problems with using their hands to put their lids in a certain position or, you know, mobilize their lids. You know, there's, there are some times when I do think that hey, insertion and removal really could be um, the reason the patient fails in scleral lenses. 
also want to think about endothelial function because the lens, the lenses are thicker than a typical corneal gas perm. We have the tear layer underneath. Um, so the combination of the lens itself plus the tear layer underneath. Um, that does compromise a bit of oxygen compared to corneal GP lenses and, and some soft lenses. So we need to make sure that we're not creating a hypoxic environment underneath the lens. Previous contact lens history is also a consideration. Um, in my mind, like any contact lens history is usually pretty good because it tells me that, hey, they've worn contacts before. They have good little ability to handle their lids. They're probably going to be less sensitive when they're putting their lens on, which leads to more success in the insertion and removal process. Um, but again, there maybe are some things like uh, chronic GPC or things like that that may um, alert you to consider pausing when it comes to moving with scleral lenses. And then there are other, uh, you know, surface findings on the sclera that may um, cause me to, you know, maybe take a step back and reconsider my contact lens options. Um, you know, some patients with, uh, you know, a tube shunt and blebs and things, um, we can do some really fancy scleral lenses over those eyes, but sometimes I just don't think we should. And we'll stick to, you know, a small diameter GP lens or something like that. So again, you kind of have to take um, all of that into picture to make sure that yes, indeed, um, this patient is a, a good candidate for fitting scleral lenses. When I talk about scleral lenses, we'll just quickly run through the, the design. And as you can see here by my list at the left, it's quite a bit more to talk about compared to the other designs. So we first talk about sagittal depth, and that's if you were to put the lens on a table, where's the apex of the lens? So it's from the edge of the lens to the top of the lens, um, and that's our sagittal depth. And we have the vault, and the vault is going to be measured from the apex of the cornea and not from the center of the lens. Chamber size, so there's a picture of a nice vault there. Chamber size is where the lens is designed to hit the ocular surface. Um, so it's usually the um, base curve in combination with the mid peripheral and limbal curves. So it does not include the lens haptics. So it's helpful to know the chamber size because that's where it's supposed to land just outside the limbus. Limbal clearance is usually described as an, um, an angle or an amount of clearance in microns. Um, so we wanna uh, see that fluorescein just past the limbus when we're putting this lens on eye. And um, I have some nice pictures to kind of discuss that in a little bit. Peripheral curves, haptics, landing curves, you know, these are kind of all, um, all terms that describe the aspect of the lens that um, places it on the eye. They can be toric, they can be quad, they can be even more specific than that. You know, this is an example of a lens that is maybe lining up in the horizontal meridian, but we have some significant edge lift in the vertical meridian. Um, and uh, so we would wanna be specifying some uh, customized haptics in a lens like this. We can certainly see edge lift. We can see in this case, maybe some blanching of the vasculature. We can see some impingement where the lens actually digs down into the conjunctival surface. What we would call, we would call this like a toe down or the edge of the lens. We call that the toe, uh, a toe down orientation. And sometimes we actually have a little um, heel down orientation where the inner edge of that landing curve is blanching, um, but the edge is not. So if you can imagine this lens is actually edge lifted a little bit and the bearing is happening closer to the limbus. So let's move into the scleral lens fitting techniques. I think if there's one thing that I want you to take home about scleral lens fitting tonight, it's that position matters. Um, so when you look at this lens, you might say, oh, there's no limbal clearance um, superiorly. But then when you take your thumb, push the lid and center that lens so that the chamber of the lens is actually centered over the limbus. Now we actually find that our chamber is probably too big for this eye. And we and that's the reason it's falling low is because there's so much room in that chamber that naturally gravity is going to take that lens down. Um, so if, again, if there's anything to take home about um, fitting scleral lenses today is that position and movement matter. So if you're seeing, you know, this lens on the left, um, as the, the patient can feel the lens so much that he actually kind of stifles his blink. So whenever he moves his eye around, you can just see how wobbly that lens is. And there's just a bunch of debris being pumped in that chamber um, compared to uh, the lens on the other side. Let me bring this back here. This is that same patient. He has Terrian's marginal degeneration with custom limbal and um, haptic curves. And so now we have a nice, really stable lens fit um, and he's doing much better. No debris in the tear chamber. Um, and you can see me trying to pump the lens there with my thumb um, and I'm not getting any movement. So um, that's the, the first thing I'm going to do on these eyes is when I have a lens on, I'm using my thumb, I'm centering it up 
so I can really assess what that chamber looks like. Because um, fitting that chamber properly to the limbal area is a big key in being successful in scleral lenses. Um, of course, we're going to look at the vault. So with the vault assessment, um, when we first put the lens on during the diagnostic evaluation, I'm looking for about three to 400 microns of clearance. And I usually use my diagnostic lens as a reference. You know, most lenses are going to be somewhere between 250 and 400 microns in uh, center thickness. So if you're somewhere close to the center thickness of the lens, then you're probably in decent shape for um, your initial vault because you'll want to expect some settling over time. So we want to build in a little bit extra vault so that at the end of the day, when the fit is all complete, the patient still has somewhere between 100 and 250 microns. And your, your specific design and lab consultant can help point you to where like, hey, in our design, this is what we want for the vault. So make sure that you understand your um, the lens that you're using in their specific recommendations compared to um, you know what you maybe have learned previously with other lens designs because it, it matters these these lenses are designed with theories in mind and um, other aspects of the lens fit um, so you really want to understand the the design of your specific lens that you're using and these are just some other examples on how it's so helpful to have some tools um, like an OCT to really understand hey if when I see this image. Do I have, you know, sufficient clearance or insufficient clearance? And because um, sometimes our our eyes can play tricks on us in the slit lamp. So an anterior segment OCT can be really helpful. Um, going over the limbo clearance, um, I think in general, uh, we run into issues with too much limbo clearance in these patients. Um, the the limbal area of patients with keratoconus, it actually takes kind of, it can take kind of a steep um, curvature. And so the lens, you know, can over clear the limbus where we're getting, you know, 200 some microns over the limbal area. And frankly, that's just too much. That's when we run into problems with clouding and uh, conjunctival prolapse. Um, so we really want to align that, you know, bring down those limbal clearances so that we're, you know, running tangential to the, uh, to the limbus um, with maybe, you know, 20 to 50 microns of clearance or so. Um, the bottom picture here is a lens that's actually landing on the limbus um, and so we would like to avoid that too. So again, patients with keratoconus can have larger corneas. So make sure that you get the chamber big enough, but not too big, of course. Um, when you're using corneal topography, it's helpful to flip to the elevation map, and that'll help you identify some trouble spots that you might see when you're fitting scleral lenses. So in this patient had a big dip in their corneal elevation um, right below this transplant junction, and you can see that we're having troubles trapping a bubble underneath there. So when you see those very abrupt changes in corneal shape on your elevation map, um, you can anticipate you know, maybe some need for some lens customizations in those areas. Poor fits over the limbus, you know, the limbus is a big player in scleral lens fitting. We used to think it was all the landing curves, um, but really it's it's about the limbus nowadays and aligning properly at the limbus helps you avoid things like microcystic edema, conjunctival prolapse, and even um, limbal stem cell deficiency. So we need to pay very careful attention. It's no longer just about I'm vaulting the limbus. You know, it's, it's not like that. We need to be more specific about how we are um, you know, aligning um, or, you know, just barely vaulting the limbal area. Landing goals. Um, really, we just want to get that entire foot or that landing zone to align properly. So after we align the lens um, at the chamber, we can use that entire landing curve to align properly to the ocular surface. And thankfully, we have so many options in these designs, again, toric, quadrant specific, sometimes even, you know, in, uh, you know, eighth portions around the lens to be as customized as possible to really get a beautiful alignment. And this is an example of an eye again that, um, you know, probably needs at least a toric peripheral curve. You can see that we have some blanching nasal temporal and we have some edge lift superior inferior. So moving this patient out of a spherical landing into a, a more customized landing would be beneficial. Um, sometimes, you know, I think one thing, again, uh, sclerals are so hot in contact lens fitting, but, um, there's a lot to it. And so sometimes sclerals aren't worth it. You know, they do take a bit more time. They're expensive. Um, and in addition to the lenses being expensive, there's visits, there's care systems. There's just a lot for patients to take on. So really do make sure that, you know, this definitely is the best best way for your patient. Um, patients do have a lot of apprehension. I follow some social media pages that are for care to groups. Patients have a ton of apprehension around losing their scleral lenses, handling their scleral lenses. So again, um, these patients and these wearers, they just need a little extra 
um, compassion when it comes to prescribing this. To us, it seems so easy. Like we put the lens on, we over refract and bam, you're seeing well, how come, how come you can't take this lens out? Um, where again, these patients have a lot of apprehension around breaking their lenses and things. So just remember that, um, you know, there's a lot into it um, emotionally for these patients in addition to the fitting process itself. We'll just wrap up with um, a couple tools of the trade that help me fit my patients better every day um, and help me make decisions. Um, and then we'll take some questions. Anterior segment OCT is so valuable. Um, I don't use it routinely. I really only use it when I need to be doing some troubleshooting, when I need to measure how much limbal clearance do I have? What does the edge look like when it's landing on this conjunctiva? So if I feel good about my fit, I'm not routinely doing anterior segment OCT, but it is really good for troubleshooting. Um, we can have many OCTs out there show more magnified views like this. Uh, we've recently... Um, started working with a, a larger diameter OCT. And while it's certainly helpful and it really creates beautiful videos for talks like this, um, I'm actually learning that the, the more magnified view is really helpful. Um, so don't feel like you have to have something massive like this, you know, just the, the regular OCT you have, if you have an anterior segment attach it, attachment, that's very sufficient to help you troubleshoot um, these lens fittings. Corneal topography with the elevation map, we kind of talked about that to help you identify those troubleshootings. You know, we have a large elevation change here, inferior nasal, and that led to actually a little bit of conjunctival prolapse. Um, so again, areas to watch for. To corneal topography is very helpful in addition to managing the keratoconus, of course. Scleral profilometry, another hot part of uh, scleral lens fitting. Um, and what we've learned through scleral profilometry is actually most patients don't really have a symmetry to their scleral shape. Um, they fall in the asymmetric elevation and depression group, 40% of patients. Um, and while thankfully 40% of patients don't need an asymmetric and very customized haptic, they can oftentimes get away with a quadrant or toric landing curves in their scleral lenses. It's just something to be aware of. And when we're talking about specifically patients who have irregular corneas, they are more likely to have more asymmetry in their scleral shape when the ectasia is further decentered from um, the cornea center. So as the ectasia is more decentered from their center of cornea, we can anticipate a more asymmetric scleral shape. You know, just something to think about when you're looking at these um, uh, topographies and correlating that to your scleral lens fits. Um, scleral profilometry can definitely help uh, identify elevation areas on the sclera so you can predict, again, where you may need to um, modify the landing curves. Taking it one step further, you know, there are scan-based designs and impression-based designs where you can send in um, these files and information, and then you can get a very customized lens that really you couldn't do with any other tool um, like you can see in this video here. Um, the scan-based, impression-based designs, they're really nice to have, um, especially for patients that travel a long distance. Like we serve a geographic area where patients may drive about three to four hours to see us. So it's nice to have that expedited fitting process in many cases, um, cause that fit is usually pretty close to spot on, on that initial lens. Um, and sometimes it's the only option for patients with very complex eyes and, um, you know, when it comes to scarring or tubes and, and things like that. Um, the, my only maybe like hiccup or sometimes where I find trouble with these imp impression and scan based designs is because they're so individualized and they're more designed on point by point, they, um, uh, the, the changes when you're trying to specify change can actually be a little bit challenging because it's more of a point by point design versus curvatures. So I can't say in and I can't go in and say, I want this radius of curvature to be flattened or steepened because um, there are no curvatures. And so sometimes you really need to have um, good imaging, you know, with an OCT, you know, anterior segment camera, those kind of things to help the laboratory make changes when you need to. Um, and as I mentioned, anterior segment photography is so helpful. Video is helpful when you can really capture those tear exchanges. Uh, or the tear exchange if you're having clouding underneath the lens, um, just really valuable tool to be able to send to your consultant um, and uh, help them help you make changes. 
Uh, just a quick tip on photography, low magnification, diffuse lighting on scleral lenses is usually what you're looking for. Um, you know, when I have residents or students working with me, they've always maybe, maybe made the um, magnification too high, and then you lose a lot of per uh, perception on what the whole lens looks like. So low magnification is a helpful tip when you're working with um, consultants and sending these lenses in for consultation. There are so many talks on Wu Yu on uh, some of these other aspects, so I'm not going to get into the optical additions when it comes to scleral lenses and the other customized lenses that we can do because we've had some. Um, I've listened to some amazing ones on multifocal optics, you know, higher order aberration correction. But I do just want to bring that to your attention again. That wow, do we have some amazing technology when it comes to um, not only fitting these lenses but then honing in on the optical needs for these patients as well. So in summary, um, just a reminder that corneal shape plays a role um, in selecting the proper lens and that top, top, health, top priority is always corneal health.